Okay. Yeah. So yes, Logan Parker, ecologist, Maine Natural History Observatory, uh, directing the the Maine Nightjar Monitoring Project. All right. So I've got a quite a bit of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, we are going to hold questions until the end. Uh, if you want to put questions in the chat, you can do that, and then I can read them at the end, or we can. It's a small enough group. I think we can. We can certainly uh, just do a Q and A, and you guys can unmute. But um, yeah, so we'll we'll get going here. There we go. So a little background on the Maine Natural History Observatory. We're a uh, nonprofit organization that started 20 years ago this year. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th birthday this year. Um, and we specialize in collecting um, natural history, natural history information, um, working on uh, assisting with collections, uh, conducting uh, different projects to gather information to inform conservation, producing uh, materials for folks to make, make identifications out in the field. And yeah, just to, trying to enable people to, to get out, get out and uh, become more familiar with, with uh, their natural surroundings. So getting down to uh, the subject of the night. So <laughs> the, the night, that's great. Um, what are night jars? So that's a question that I'm asked all the time. I've got a nice main night jar monitoring logo on the side of my car and people constantly say, what is that? Um, uh, night jars are a, a group of cryptically plumed birds. That means they are birds that are essentially uh, intended to not be seen. Their, their plumage is, is great camouflage. Um, they're are a number of species that can be found across several continents. Uh, none in Antarctica, unfortunately. We don't have any penguin nightjars. Um, they're short-legged. They have really small bills, um, very large mouths. So, so small bill, large mouth. Um, and these many of them have these long uh, rictal bristles uh, that you can see in the lower the lower uh, image there that are almost whisker-like. And they have these pectinate claws that look like little combs on the ends of their central toes. They've got very large eyes. Um, that's because these are primarily nocturnal or crepuscular birds. Um, they have a large number of rod cells and a reflective structure in their eye that enables them to see really well at night. So uh, where does the term night jar come from? Well, they were uh, historically known as, as goat suckers for quite a long time. And uh, <laughs> that was a, a, mis a misnomer. They, uh, they were thought to drink goat's milk. They do not. Um, they, uh, they do eat insects. Um, so they were often maybe around livestock historically, but nope, no goat milk drinking night jars at, up to this point. Um, the European nightjar was was probably the first species to be referred to as a nightjar. Um, they're active at night, and the sound they make uh, was described as making a jarring sound. So night jarring sound, you've got nightjar. Um, so they're largely referred to as as nightjars now, but you do still hear them referred to as goat suckers from time to time, and it is in in the uh, taxonomy. Um, across this group, most of them do not construct nests. They just lay their eggs right on the ground and instead uh, rely on camouflage to just disappear into their, their surroundings. Uh, their eggs usually blend in quite well um, and uh, their young will blend in well. I've, I've found a couple of, of nightjar nests over the last few years and they're very difficult to detect. It's a lot, a lot to do with luck, um, but they're they're essentially motionless all day, and uh, will either if they're if they're incubating, they're right on top of their eggs and, and won't move unless they're you're really close, or they'll they'll roost up on tree branches where they'll actually they'll lay with the branch as opposed to you know overhanging it like most birds do. So uh, we've got a handful of of uh, noteworthy night jars here. These are some of the. The, the visual standouts, um, you know, the great eared nightjar, that's that's the largest species. And uh, the uh, pennant winged and the standard winged nightjar both have these really 
uh, long trailing uh, feathers that they have during the breeding season that they use for, for courtship. Some some of their their uh, close relatives. I usually call them the awkward the awkward cousins. We've got the the poo-toos, the frog mouths, and the uh, the owlet nightjars. They're they're uh, I guess they they're kind of cute. Um, but yes, they're these are all tropical birds. And then they're also closely related to another more uh, familiar uh, bird that we see around here. They they share a clad with a bird that often surprises people, and that's hummingbirds. They're actually quite closely related to hummingbirds and also swifts. Um, hummingbirds evolved from a common ancestor that was nocturnal, and now we have our, our hummingbirds. You can see some similar features. Hummingbirds also have very short, short legs, small feet. Um, they also have very narrow bills, and uh, yeah. So, um, I guess we're we're primarily interested in Maine's nightjars tonight, right? So um, there are two two species um, that we're going to focus on for the sake of this project. That's the eastern whippoorwill and the common nighthawk. Um, these two have historically been confused with one another, although they're they're quite different from one another in, in terms of their appearance and their behavior. Um, so we'll we'll talk about them both a little more in depth in a moment here. So the Eastern Whippoorwill, uh, it's a, a nocturnal species. This is a medium-sized nightjar. They're about the size of a robin, um, very stocky. And uh, they sing an onomatopoeic song. That's where they get their name. Their song has been described as sounding like Whippoorwill. Um, they they do nest on the ground, right on leaf litter generally, um, usually near uh, a, a shrub or a stump. And uh, they're they're insectivores, so they're eating moths and beetles and ants and flies. Um, and yes, they so they sing their songs um, often repeatedly uh, from a number of points around around their breeding territory. And it was thought that that just the males sang for quite some time, but actually the females also sing uh, a song as well. Uh, it's a softer sounding song, but they, they do sing. Um, both males and females do incubate. They both have, have brood patches um, and they both care for young. They, they can double brood in, in certain parts of their range. Um, and when they're, when they're disturbed, they will perform some pretty uh, elaborate uh, displays, whether if it's a territorial uh, skirmish, they can do this, this sort of hovering flight where they flash their tail feathers at these white patches on the side. Or if in a, you know, a nest, um, you know, disruption scenario, they can feign injury and make a big, big scene and try to lead off any potential predators. Uh, they've been undergoing widespread declines in recent decades. They're uplisted to near threatened. Um, on the IUCN red list a few years ago. Um, you know, these birds, night jars in general, are chronically understudied. And uh, and so they they were quite common at a, at a certain point in time. But um, yeah, they just sort of abruptly vanished over the last several decades. So part of the reason why we're here. Common nighthawk is another night jar species we have here in Maine. Uh, this is a much more widespread species. They're found uh, all throughout the continent, and uh, they they do migrate down to South America in the overwinter there. They're about the same size as a as a whippoorwill. Um, they also have very cryptic plumage. Um, they're more apt to blend into these sort of barren environments where they nest, um, areas without a lot of vegetation. Uh, you know, gravelly ground or even gravel rooftops in urban areas. Um, they eat insects as well. They uh, they will forage under artificial lights like street lights or stadium lighting. Um, and uh, they're they're different from whippoorwills in that whippoorwills uh, will sally out from a perch and grab prey. Um, they'll wait on a perch. Nighthawks are much more active. Uh, you know. Uh, pursuit hunters that will chase down insects on the wing. So um, yeah, actually just last night, we, I was out with our technician. We were watching a nighthawk foraging and they're just 
They go and go and go. They also perform uh, aerial courtship and territorial displays. Um, it's, it's referred to as booming. It makes a sort of rushing sound. It's a mechanical sound of the air being forced through their wings as they do as they do a dive. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll often do that over, over their nesting grounds or near their young. Um, and yeah, I, although widespread, this is a, another species that we're seeing a, a lot of declines. And, we, we see that uh, among night jars really as, as a whole group, but also the broader sense among aerial insectivores. So I said there were two, two night jar species in Maine, but there's actually a third sort of. So we, uh, we also occasionally get Chuck Will's widow in, in Maine, um, it, especially in recent years, they've become you know, still rare, but locally regular at a couple of sites. Um, they're fairly closely related to Eastern Whippoorwill, though, um, and they do look quite similar, but their their heads are much larger, and their mouths are much larger. And because of that, they're, they can, um, you know, forage for a wider range of prey. Uh, they'll do predominantly eat insects, but they also are capable of taking small birds, hummingbirds, actually. Uh, bats and frogs. So, uh, they've they've been described as actually foraging on the ground at points during molts. Um, they've been undergoing northward range expansions, although they also are experiencing declines at the same same time. Um, but they they've been creeping their way northward along the Atlantic coast, and they were seen in the Cape for a while. But yeah, they're starting to pop up in in New Hampshire and Maine, and even the Maritimes occasionally. So. Mm -hmm. Um, often these are, you know, presumably overshoots that have, have gone beyond their, their breeding range, but it is noteworthy that they, there are at least some individuals returning to the same sites year, year, and, you know, year after year. Um, that said, they've never been, this, you know, confirmed as breeding within the state. So they're a species to be very familiar with in the context of this project. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that we, we we may find ourselves uh, find ourselves a, a breeding pair of Chuck Will's widow before too long. Um, hopefully, you can see this video. You can see it. Yes, I see nodding. Great. Um, hopefully, it will play for you. But this is a Chuck Will's widow. This is just for context. This is at a rehab facility. I like this video because it really demonstrates um, you know the the size of their mouth. It's quite quite deceptive. See this. It, there's a really tiny, tiny bill there in the center, but um, yeah, check this out. There you go. So very large mouth. Yeah, so the status of these birds in Maine is 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 interesting. So, um, like many other other regions, we we have widespread um, anecdotal evidence of decline, but it, these species weren't studied really very closely. Um, so we don't have a lot of data to s speak to it specifically. But what what data we have certainly suggests that. Um, so. The uh, the general consensus is yes, there are far fewer of these birds than there were. We have, there are a lot of folks that say, oh yes, we always have these birds outside of our camp, outside of our house every summer. They drove us crazy. They were so loud, and now they're gone and we miss them. So it's a very common story, um, and because of that, uh, these species were listed as greatest conservation need by the uh, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and. Uh, They've also been listed as special concerned, threatened, and even endangered by other state wildlife management agencies um, and in, in uh, you know, Canadian provinces. So um, this really spurred a, a, a lot of movement um, you know, early in the 21st century to get some monitoring efforts underway. Um, So a, a lot of people will ask about threats to nightjars, and then it's a somewhat, well, it's a 
really an unsatisfying answer at the moment, and that's that we don't really know for certain. So there are several likely culprits, and in reality, we think that many of these things are co-occurring and compounding the issue. So things like destruction of habitat, uh, predation from free-roaming pets, um, you know, we know that cats can sometimes get these ground, or, you know, free-range cats can get these ground nesters. Um, we have video of, of you know, dogs uh, taking night hawk or night, uh, yeah, night hawk nestlings um, because of their, uh, they do will, will sometimes per land on roadsides and actually, you know, as one of their territory boundaries, they might land in a road and get struck by a vehicle. Um, pesticides, these are insectivores. So, um, you know, if there are pesticides impacting their prey, they can end up picking that up. And then the decline of, of their major prey insects. So um, we know about the, the uh, you know, larger insect population declines that are going on. And specifically, a lot of the, the large um, silkworm moths have, have been declining. So the Cecropia moth, Polyphemus moth, a lot of these really large, large moths that these species are, are uh, you know, associated with foraging on just aren't as common. So there's a lot of effort going into documenting, you know, what did these birds eat historically by looking at, um, you know, old, old uh, museum specimens, but also looking at what are they, these birds eating now? Are they, are they still getting, you know, some high quality forage? How are they sustaining themselves? And we're starting to do that here in Maine. So monitoring night jars. So um, that's what we're really, really talking about tonight. Um, so in order to monitor night jars, we have to sort of meet them where they're at and, and take advantage of the ways in which they are, um, you know, detectable to us. And so I told you these birds are very cryptic and, and difficult to find. Their, their um, breeding or their uh, ecology is essentially they try not to be seen, but they do want to be heard. And so they do sing and they sing a lot and they do perform courtship displays in some instances. And uh, so we are really trying to, to uh, get ourselves all out conducting surveys when these birds are at their most detectable. And that, that involves being out on moonlit nights in May and uh, June and July when these birds are singing during their, their breeding season. So nighthawks are more crepuscular, that is they're more active at dusk and dawn, um, but they, they are also active on moonlit nights. They'll, they'll continue foraging when, when things are quite bright. And uh, whippoorwills are, are active right through the night on moonlit nights. They're, they're, they'll also sing at dawn and dusk, but uh, the, their activity will peak when the conditions are right. And their breeding is actually very closely tied with lunar conditions. So um, these, these uh, conditions provide them ample opportunity to broadcast their territories when they're not competing with other birds um, and uh, making themselves vulnerable to predation. But it also provides an opportunity for them to forage because they are visual predators that are looking for prey. And so they use those bright nights as sort of a backlight for insects that pass over. So um, we got to go out when they're when they're visible. So in order to do that, we've we've created some standardized surveys that go beyond things like the breeding bird survey, which is done during the day, um, or things like the Christmas bird count that occur in the wrong season for them, um, you know, in in this part of the world, and uh, and design specialized surveys under which we can we can find these birds. And so in Maine, we we did that by starting the the Maine Nightjar monitoring project. So we uh, started this effort in 2017. It was myself and one other volunteer um, who expressed interest in, in looking for whippoorwills at the time. Um, other efforts had started in other parts of the country, but the general consensus at the time was, oh, there wasn't a lot of interest in, in running routes in Maine. And we've proven that, that uh, you know, uh, assumption wrong. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in conducting surveys in Maine, and we've had a number of, of volunteers that have come back 
year after year, many of them running multiple routes a year. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for nitrous in Maine. Um, we have uh, established a number of routes. We've grown the number of routes as the years have gone on to, to reach other areas. We now have over, over 70 routes um, that are all across the state. And these are mon monitored annually to document population trends and their distribution. So we partnered with the Maine Bird Atlas, and uh, that was that was a great partnership for our project. We encouraged um, you know our volunteers to go out and collect some of this nocturnal data that might not necessarily have been captured. And they were they were getting observations of other bird species too at the time, and um, so that was really uh, beneficial for us both because um, there were there were many many night uh, many many atlas volunteers that that took part in that project so we were able to leverage that to, to our advantage for this project which is fantastic but that that project has ended and uh because this is a long-term monitoring project we're we're going to continue with this project although we are changing things slightly um so we're moving a little bit closer to other efforts that are occurring on the continent, like the Canadian NYCHAR survey and the, the NYCHAR survey network so that our data can be shared uh, across these across these projects. And, and for those of you that are here that have participated in these projects before, you know, and you're, I know, you know, personally, when I am in a project, I wanna see results. So um, there, we are doing data analysis on those on those five years of data that we collected and uh, you know we're gonna make that available as, as soon as possible. It will it will be in, it will be uh, available in the um, main bird atlas, but it it likely will be available far sooner than that is completed. Um, but yes, yeah, so look look forward to that. So as we go forward, um, just for those of you that are new, we'll just talk about some of the requirements of participating in this project. They're not ter terribly stringent, although there are some, some important factors. So you need to be able to identify our night jars uh, by, by sight and by sound. Generally, by sound. We're burning by ear because it's it's night. Uh, the, you, you may see a night hawk flying around. It's rare that you're going to see, see a whippoorwill. So you've got to be familiar with the a whippoorwill song and also the Chuck Little's Widow song and if you stumble on one of them. Um, for those of you that have been with the project in the past, you are not required to report other species that you hear. Um, it's certainly, you're certainly welcome to, and it's any data you collect is valuable that enables us to share that with, with others that are, in, that, you know, could use that information. So if you're, if you're open to it, please continue, um, but do not feel, do not feel obligated to continue reporting other species that you hear. Um, the other thing that's that's important is you need to have reliable access to a vehicle. Um, so you move quickly between each of the survey points and we'll talk about the, the nitty gritty of the surveys in a moment. But um, so the surveys are, are, the points are spaced about a mile apart and you need to be able to quickly move from point to point. Um, volunteers each year get a, a, a new copy of the main night jar monitoring handbook with updated information. We also provide uh, route maps, and coordinates, and a uh, printable vehicle placard. Um, those, some of you have received some of that information already. If you haven't received it, you're gonna be receiving it um, tomorrow. So the, the last of the, the maps are going out tomorrow. So look for that. Okay, so but you've signed up for the project. What what does the project entail at this point? So um, you did you adopt a, a route. So there's routes that are available. We'll, I'll show you what that looks like on the site. Um, but you adopt a route, and these routes consist of a series of points. Each of these points um, should be scouted ahead of time. So we encourage everyone to go out during the day document the habitat at each point and also document the safe places to pull off. So that's that's really important. You don't want to go out at night and just be headed towards a uh, headed towards uh, you know an, a point on a map and then come to find, oh, there's nowhere for me to park here. It's not safe. So um, we definitely want to have people going out ahead of time. Um, survey points can be moved in the event that you're scouting and you find that you know it's 
you know, in a, in a dangerous location, like a, like a um, corner, you know, sharp corner, a blind corner, or if it's blocking someone's driveway or, or it's, you know, right in front of a house with a barking dog out right out front that, you know, you're worried about. We don't want you to feel unsafe. Um, you can move a point up to 0.2 miles. Um, and if you find that you have to move it beyond that, we just advise you to skip that point, you know, take a note and say, I can't do this point. There's no safe location. You know, it's important for us to know. And it's a, we should also remember, so moving one point doesn't mean you move all of the remaining points. So just if you move one, once you're, you've completed that point, just go to the next point as you normally would. So the survey method, as I, as I mentioned, the, you have a route and that route consists of a series of points. Those points are one mile apart. Um, points, uh, the routes are either 10 or 12 points long. Um, we do have new, newly added survey points or uh, newly added routes with survey points. And they can actually be up to 12 points. So um, historically, we've always had 10 point routes. It's small change, but um, you're spending six minutes at each point listening. It's passive listening, meaning we don't have any playback of any kind. You're simply pulling up to the site, writing, you know, starting to fill out your data sheet, starting a stopwatch and listening for six minutes. You're tracking individual birds across that six minutes. So um, you've got minute one through six and you're keeping track. If you hear a whippoorwill in all six minutes, you're noting that. Um, so you're recording, as I mentioned, all nightjar species seen or heard, but you can record other species. You hear owls or oven birds or anything else, you can certainly record that. Uh, each point is surveyed once annually. That's a change for some of you that have been with the project. So you only have to run it one time each year. Um, it's conducted on calm, moonlit nights, and that means greater than or equal to 50% illumination. Um, the, the handbook that we provide has information on, on these lunar, lunar cycles when these can be done, and information on moonrise time. The moon is really important to these surveys, so it's something we have to really pay attention to. Uh, surveys can begin up to 30 minutes prior to sunset and must be completed no later than 30 minutes prior to sunset. Um, there will be times when you can start your survey early right there at that 30 minute prior to sunset mark, but as the season goes on, that can change. Again, we'll talk about that more specifically. But um, generally, the sooner you can run your surveys, the better. Um, so if you, if you were to run your survey 30 minutes prior to sunset, or let's say 15 minutes prior to sunset, your chances of, of picking up Nighthawk are generally a, a bit higher. So um, that's why we're starting it earlier. There's going to be a lot of other competing birds at that period, and your, your whippoorwills might not start for a little while. So um, you know, it's a it's a balancing act, but you've got a, a wide window of time when you can conduct these generally. So it it's valuable to be aware of some of the other birds that are out there because you're going to hear things and you might you might not be familiar with them. So um, you know, American woodcock is is a regular. Uh, there's a number of owl species that that you could hear. Uh, the thrushes tend to be very active at at a um, dusk, so you hear a lot of uh, thrush song. Chimney swifts also tend to be out foraging. Um, really, I can't believe they're not on here. But oven bird is <laughs> oven bird was the the most reported species. So oven birds are active, very active, um, right through the night. They actually do a, a, a courtship display at night. So yeah, being aware of them is important, as is being aware of some of the other wildlife that, that is active at night. There are many insects that are active and, and vocal and making lots of, lots of sounds. Um, vocal, but uh, yeah, um, there's also coyotes, you know, that's not unusual to hear them out, um, you know, vixen screams of foxes and um, amphibians. Sometimes the amphibians are just deafening at a certain point if you're near any water at all. Um, and it's, we have a we have a means of recording 
the the noise at the point. When I see a three, I generally think, oh, like there are a lot of frogs here. Um, so if you are documenting other birds, or if you were to stumble upon a chuckle's widow, um, we do we do ask that you we put in a little extra effort in documenting these. Some of these these I mean all of these species are quite rare. Um, so if you were to come across any of these, if certainly take notes, but if you can get a recording, that's great. And in fact, um, you know, I've had had people suggest actually running a passive recording on your phone while you're surveying. That's perfectly fine. You can you can do that um, as a reference. And if uh, you get a, a you know a, a an unusual or rare bird vocalizing during your survey, you've got that to to present to uh, to the eBird reviewers that will inevitably arrive to to question <laughs> the uh, validity of that. Um, but yeah, so do spend time documenting that. Um, so yeah, down to the, the logistics of the surveys themselves. So timing, this is something that changes every year. So annual timing changes every single year. Um, so we work within these lunar cycles. It's anywhere from two to three cycles per year um, that are based on lunar conditions. And that's the period during which the moon is at least 50% illuminated. So it starts um, with the, uh, you know, the waning or the waxing moon and we reach the full moon, drops down to 50% illumination, then we're, we're the, uh, the conditions aren't conducive anymore. Um, so this year, our first lunar cycle is quite late. And actually, I'm thinking that that's a great thing this time. So it's been cold, and night jars are not terribly active when it's cold. Um, so uh, the, the first lunar cycle this year is, is May 27th through June 10th. So that's the first window of time to conduct your surveys. And the second lunar cycle runs from June 26th through July 9th. And so it's during that period, you that's that's your those are your windows for conducting your survey. So daily timing, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but um, in a little more detail here. So um, surveys generally take anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours to complete, depending on the route, um, especially now that we have some routes that are a little bit longer. Um, the surveys can be conducted, as I said, um, 30 minutes prior to sunset and must be wrapped up by 30 minutes prior to sunrise. And um, it's important to budget your time. So especially if you're conducting these surveys later in these lunar cycles. So as, as the cycle goes on, the moon rises later and later and later, and your window of time for conducting survey, surveys is narrowed as time goes on. Um, so you've just got to look at the date and time that you're going to conduct your surveys, look at the moonrise time, and uh, make sure that you budget enough time to actually get out there and, and wrap this up before, before the sun comes up or the moon goes down. So survey conditions. So these are, uh, you know, uh, we have some fairly strict conditions under which surveys are to be conducted. So although those two lunar cycles seem like a lot of time, um, you know, to, to run a survey, every year it's a challenge, you know, for, for especially for folks that are running more than one route, because getting all of these things to align can be tricky. And so that's why I encourage people to run their surveys as early as possible within their, their lunar cycle and not just bank on, oh, well, there'll be another good night. Um, if you've got a good night, you should really go for it, especially early on. Um, the moon, like I said, has to be at least 50% illuminated. Uh, you want to be going out when the winds are calm, ideally, but light winds are acceptable. Um, clear skies are preferable, but partly cloudy skies are okay. So if you've got drifting clouds that are passing by, that's that's okay. Um, you you really want that moon to be um, visible, visible and illuminated. Um, if you start your surveys and then it starts to cloud up and and uh, you're you continue running your surveys and it's just staying cloudy for for you know uh, more than two two or three points, it's it's time to to wrap up and try again on another night. 
So um, you really want to be doing this when the birds are more, more likely to be vocal, because that those birds are going to be, uh, you know, the vocalizations will drop off as as the uh, lunar can, as the the moon is blocked. Um, you don't want to be out in steady precipitation of any kind, um, rain, snow, drizzle. Um, if it's really foggy and you know you're having a difficult time seeing, it's not very particularly safe for you to be out doing surveys on the side of the road anyway. Um, but again likely that these birds aren't going to vocalize. Same goes for if it's really cold. So had we started, had we had an earlier lunar cycle this year, you know, I, I probably would have steered people away from conducting surveys for a little while. Um, I've been out and I've heard some, some night jars active, but we know that they're around, but they're not super vocal, that the vocalization just drops off as soon as it starts to cool down at night. So if it's, if it, you see it dip below 50, start to really uh, reassess whether you should be out running surveys. Um, I check the forecast the morning of the my survey effort, and I then I check it again um, just before, or really at midday, and, and then again right before I head out, because things do change. You know, I've, I've seen, um, you know, cloud cover forecast change pretty dramatically over the course of the day, so keep your eyes on that. Um, often, sometimes, you know, uh, local conditions are really different than what's forecast, too. So, like, if you're you live near your your route if you're right nearby and you look out and see oh no this this actually looks pretty good you know you might be able to run from your survey but um, definitely keep keep tabs on on the weather. So we also have a, a little core group in in this uh, project we call the Night Jar Reserve and so those are volunteers that are on call uh, essentially to help us cover volunteer routes so. If someone has, you know, a car issue or they, you know, something happens and they're unable to participate, um, they can let me know and then I can put out a, a message to the, the people that, that sign on to this night jar reserve and say, hey, can any of you cover this route? And that's worked really well. Um, we've had people that, you know, say, oh, I, I'd be willing to cover some routes in York County or, um, you know, if if there's a route near Bangor, I can I can run I could run that if if they needed help, um, and then if if all of the routes are covered, um, and you know uh, we we don't have a, a need for additional coverage at the time, I still recommend that people go out and if you got a good night, go look for go look for night jars. Um, you know if you if you're on eBird, report them to eBird, or if not, you know just. Um, you know, get out and become more familiar with the species. Look for look for them where um, you think you can find them, and you might put a new spot on the map. All right. So yeah, talking about safety, as I, I mentioned before, you always want to scout your route ahead of time. Um, you you want to be going there during the day, not the night of. It's it's just too hairy. We've had volunteers that have gone off on a soft shoulder before and gotten stuck. Um, you know, it's it's important that you are very aware of of uh, you know the the safe places to pull off and familiar with each of your points. Um, make sure that you're visible. So that means wearing a reflective vest, um, wearing a headlamp, and uh, or wearing a headlamp or having a flashlight. Bring extra batteries. I mean, the last thing you want is for your headlamp to die right in the middle of a survey, and you're trying to fill it out in the dark it would be a challenge. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that you can pull off the road way as, as much as possible and and then stand off of the road. I usually will stand on the opposite side of the road uh, or the opposite side of my car from the road. So I've got that barrier there. Um, and uh, yeah, bring a, 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 a map with you. So we do, like I said, provide you with a, a map of your route. Um, make sure you have a physical copy of that for reference. Share that with someone else that isn't going out with you so they know where you're going. If, if you don't show up, they'll know where to look for you. Um, bring a survey partner. So you, you certainly can partner up with, with someone else. Um, only one of you should be listening for night jars and reporting what you hear. It's not a double observer project. Um, we're, we're just having one person do it. But that other person can help navigate. Um, they, can, they can help keep track of the time. Um, they can, they, there's a lot of ways in which they can help. So. Um, yeah, I, I've I've gone out and brought others with me before, and it's, it's good company as you're traveling between your your points. So if you adopt a route and you find that you can't cover it, 
um, for the reasons I mentioned before, um, you just reach out. We we really want to make sure that every route is is um, completed each year. And while we do, um, you know, there is a system for temporarily suspending some routes. Um, if we have a route that's active, we want it run. You know, uh, that's that's really important. So let me know as soon as possible, and then I can get that message out to the to either. Um, you know, someone that signed up as a backup for a particular route or to the that night jar reserve group so that they can um, they can see if they can cover it. So yeah, I, I also just want to fill people in on on some expansion that's happening within this you know larger umbrella project focused on night jars. So um, it's a really exciting time for this project. Uh, we we launched a pilot effort this this spring um, with Inland Fisheries and Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and the Biodiversity Research Institute, and we're focusing on whippoorwills this year specifically on their nesting ecology and movement ecology um, at a number of sites throughout the state. So we uh, we hired a, a technician, and the technician and I are going to be going out, and we've we've actually already started scouting some of these these study sites, and we're going to be uh, tracking these birds through the, the nesting the nesting season and gathering information on things like, um, you know, nest success and predation and, um, you know, uh, departure and arrival time. So these are all things that we, we uh, really don't know anything about with these with these birds. So also, you know, collecting things relating to their their diet. So there's some really important stuff that's being collected in this project. So um, yeah, so look look for uh, updates on that. Um, we'll we'll definitely be broadcasting what we're what we're finding out in the field, and uh, we're very we're likely to expand those efforts, and we're certainly likely to continue them into 2024 and you know uh, 2025, and possibly cover some other night jar species like like uh, the common nighthawk. So, um, yeah, it's going to be an exciting year. So, yeah, um, many of you have already signed up for Roots, which is fantastic. And I'm truly, truly grateful um, if you haven't adopted a route yet and you live near any of these routes listed on the screen, please consider joining. Um, the first, the first uh, lunar cycle is just a couple of days away. Um, so we really want to get folks out there and, and get these routes covered. Um, these are all scattered throughout the state. So depending on no matter really where you are, you probably have a route nearby that's available. Or if, if you don't, you you like to uh, you like to travel and and see other parts of the state, you know, uh, it's one night, you know, if you want to go and, and camp up at Katahdin Woods and Waters and and do uh, do a night jar survey, I, you know, all the power to you. That would, that would be a huge help to us. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll put out a, a call to to try to get more people on these routes. But if uh, you know anyone that might be interested, you know, certainly forward them our uh, our information, our our website, mainnightjar.com. And I just want to say a quick thanks to all these people. So we've had a lot of support for for this project. Um, you know, again, it's it's really heartening after the, those early days of the suggestion that Maine wasn't really interested in these birds. Um, you know, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has been huge in supporting these projects and Biodiversity Research Institute as well. And we've worked with a lot of landowners and uh, land managers, you know, the Passamaquoddy Wild Blueberry Company, Hoosick Land Trust, Great Pond Mountain Conservation Trust, um, you know, providing opportunities to get out on, on conservation lands or, you know, private lands. Um, and, uh, other organizations like Down East Audubon and the Katie Birding Festival and a number of foundations that have provided, uh, you know, um, support, support through funding to actually facilitate this project. And, uh, you know, uh, the Maine Natural History Observatory members and volunteers that have participated in this project or contributed to fundraisers, you know, it truly, we would not be able to do th this project without all the support that we've received. And I am very grateful um, that for all of all of these folks. Um, and you know, if you're you're thinking you you're not sure if you want to commit to taking on a route um, this year, but you want to support the project in another way, uh, you could become a member of the Maine Natural Hi History Observatory. So we recently started memberships, and uh, 
And uh, yeah, there's a number of, of wonderful uh, perks to being a member. Right now, if you were to join, you get one of these, these uh, limited edition purple sandpiper stickers, which are really great. Jada Finch, a, a Maine artist, designed those. So there's more information about membership on at mainnaturalhistory.org. Um, and with that, I will switch over to questions. So just give me a moment to set up my screen in a better way. Okay. All right, so yes, like I said, it's a small group. So um, certainly if anyone has questions, uh, you're welcome to welcome to unmute and I will happily answer anything you'd like to know about the project. If you have questions, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Um, well, I have a question. Um, I'm a little confused about the timing if like we start 30 minutes before sunset but the moon doesn't rise until 10. Uh, yeah, so so the, the moon rise is the, the first order of business. So the moon has to have been, the moon has to rise before you run the survey. So the first thing you're going to look at is, is the moon going to be in the sky during my survey? And then within that, you know, mo the moon can rise, you know, first it can be, it can rise during the day. It, it certainly does rise during the day. So it may be that when you go out to conduct your surveys, the moon is is already up at that time. Other times, you know, um, you you won't necessarily be able to start your surveys thirty minutes, you know, prior to sunset. You if you're going to run your survey on on a night where uh, the moonrise isn't until midnight, let's say, you know, you're going to be running your surveys towards the the middle of the night. And the police are cool with this. <laughs> <laughs> it, yes, they they have been. So I've I have had people I've had a lot of people stop before. Actually, it's really worth mentioning. So I've had people stop before. Uh, I've never had a really negative uh, you know experience with anyone. Lots of people will check to make sure you're okay. I have had the police stop before and say you know what's going on. And as soon as I say oh I'm doing I'm looking for whippoorwills, they're like oh okay and off they go. But with that in mind, you know. I have called local law enforcement agencies and said, hey, I'm going to be in the area doing a survey. And, uh, you know, if you get calls from along this road, it's it's just me, you know, so um, and that's been helpful. So, yes, that's a it's a wonderful thing to bring up. <laughs> yeah, I used to run uh, owl surveys and we had a local sheriff stop. A couple of years in a row. And yeah. Yeah, we just told him what we were doing, and he chatted for a while. And then yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. sounds about right. Yep, yep. <laughs> no, but generally, people are pretty excited about the project. Um, you know, people. A lot of people have, uh, you know, a, a strong, um, you know, association or or, or uh, you know, they have uh, a lot of people have you know memories of of whippoorwills at their their property and and uh, as soon as they hear that you're doing a whippoorwill survey they tend to be kind of excited which is kind of cool um or they might say i have no idea what that is <laughs> and you can explain oh it's a nocturnal bird um but yeah uh we do have a uh, actually a printout sheet that we have for people that if you like you know ideally we don't want people stopping and, and chatting for a long time on the side of the road uh, while you're trying to conduct a timed survey so you can say, oh, I'm doing a survey. Um, you know, if you want to know more, here's uh, some information. So we have that. That's up on our site. And actually, I'll I'll circulate that when I circulate all the root the root maps and coordinates, um, so that people can print those off and have those on hand. It does happen. When I was working on the the main bird atlas um, and running point counts, that was something that happened. You know, fairly often people would stop and want to chat. So, um, yeah. So I did see I have a question in the chat. Um, let me pull that up. That was from you, Kate. So multiple questions. Let me see if I can parse them out and not skip anything. So, OK, great question. So Kate asks, if I find one of the special species, should we stay at the stop more than six minutes to get better documentation? Y yeah, you can. So operate as you 
really as you normally would if you if you can um, within that six minute period continue to track your birds across each you know across the six minutes but then if you want to if you haven't gotten documentary evidence during that six minute period you want to stay for a few extra minutes at the point and try to get a recording that's okay we'd understand why you did that you know looking at your notes um I, the reason why we say we want people to move quickly between points is because we don't want birds moving between points well you know from one point to the next so we're not repeat counting birds but we also know generally these birds don't move around a lot so they tend to kind of stay in a given area but we just to eliminate that possibility which encourage people to move quickly between the points if i hope that makes sense um but if you do need to stay and try to get a little bit if you want to stay for a few minutes and try to get a recording of a long-eared owl then please do that yeah that's that's great um your next question we have a stop in the middle of the in the middle of a route should we run the entire route again oh if we have to stop in the middle of a route should we run the entire route again or is it okay to start the stop where we ended previously that's a great question as well um so we would want you to run the route again um and for that same reason it's the idea that birds might be moving between these points between surveys so we might they may relocate to another site it, you know from one night to the next um so we want to try to get us we're, we're each of these surveys is essentially a snapshot of a given night so um yes we'd have you rerun the route which is a pain sometimes if you've completed most of your survey and then you find oh i've got to go back out again um but it is a uh it is a um, important, important part of the survey. Um, Dan asks, when do we get a copy of our route? Tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, we update, we're updating the route maps. Uh, we, we've actively actively been working on that now. Um, and yeah, they're all gonna they're all gonna go out tomorrow. If you if you don't have it yet, you'll have it tomorrow. Any other questions from anyone? Um so we could like maybe use the Merlin app to record at each point. You could. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Or I mean you can just use your whatever recording app on your the phone. Bolton, yeah. You know, any um, of them is fine. Well, I'm more likely to know it's a short ear cowl if it tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be a useful tool for for you know uh narrowing your narrowing your search, but um yeah, I mean, certainly if you get something and you get a recording of it and you're not 100% sure of what it is, you know, um, you can send that recording to me and either I can listen to it or send it to someone who, you know, has more experience with some of those unusual owl vocalizations. So there are some strange ones, but um, we can help. We can help figure it out for sure. And then you just do the route once each night during the. <laughs> You're, so you're actually just running it once, one time through your whole your whole survey period. You just are going out one night. That's oh, it. in the whole period. Okay. Yep, just one time, one round of the route. I one I should say, you're doing your habitat scouting once, and you're running a survey once. So technically, you're going to go out on your route twice, <laughs> just to be clear. But you're running the survey one time. Okay. And I, and I do have a conflict of I'm away from the Memorial Day holiday. Oh yeah, so then you that's fine. I mean, that's there's a lot of time in there um, where you okay. you can you can hopefully run run that run that survey. Um, okay. And again, so the 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 handbook so the handbook contains a lot of um, really valuable information. It's like I said, I up, we update it every year. It has all of the moonrise and um, it has sunset and sunrise times for the lunar cycle, moonrise and moonset times for the lunar cycle. Um, it has all of the survey information that we've described here in this training, your data sheets, and more thorough, um, you know, instructions, examples of of uh, you know completed data sheets as a reference. But I will say too, if you need help reach out. I'm, you know, I try to be really uh, accessible to help support this project. It's been harder in recent years. I've been doing a lot of stuff 
remote in remote parts of the state the last two years. But this year, I'm this is what I'm doing. I'm out looking for for night jars. So I definitely want to I want to help you guys if you ever if you're ever having a problem. You know, I, my contact information is is in the the handbook. You can call me. You can text me. You can email me. I will be happy to happy to help you if I can. So I actually have another question. Yeah. Are we still supposed to be tracking or noting, making note of birds if they've moved on the yes. data sheet? And yep. how with nighthawks, I mean, whippoorwills pretty much stays in one spot and they might move a little, yeah. but nighthawks are just going to be flying around. So yeah. how any suggestions on how to yeah yeah so nighthawks I almost, I almost always expect that i'm gonna see a check mark in the column the move column for nighthawks because they're so active um and that's fine essentially the move column is it's really for for you to track these individuals and make sure that you're you're not double counting um you're just saying, yeah, this is the same bird and it's just moving around. Um, so if it's moving, if it's really active and you think that it's moving between, especially if you think it's moving between points, like it's, you you went to the next point and this Nighthawk came flying in from the same direction you saw it headed at the last point, And you, you think, yeah, I think this is the same bird. It's, it's a judgment call. So um, we, we do, we leave it to you to decide if you think that it's a repeat bird, has it moved on you? Um, but yeah, nighthawks are always moving. They're just constantly flapping around. Which also makes it like, if you have more than one at a survey point, which does happen sometimes, mm -hmm. like how do you try to keep track of which one you're hearing during each minute it's or it's very it's very difficult <laughs> i i think yeah we 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 are aware that these birds are likely moving around a lot and so yeah just make your best estimate of the number of birds that are there and you know when in doubt if you don't if you're like ah, is there another bird or not I would I would err on the side of not including a bird in that instance. I, if I'm thinking, yeah, it could be another one, you know, that's just flying around. Um, especially if you have a number of birds. If you you're right, I mean, nighthawks, you can have you know three or four birds at a single point. Sometimes more than that if you're in a really open area where they're they're nesting because their individual distance is not very large. Um, so yeah, it's it is tough with with them specifically. <laughs> Whippoorwills do move a lot, but they 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 move in a given area. So they'll they'll just sort of circle around to each of their singing points. Um, so if you catch some of that and you're, you know, you become suspicious of you're you're worried about double counting. That's I guess that's when you would use that for them. But we don't see it as much with them. You know, it's not not as common. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Another question here. One okay. Okay. One completed survey for each route completed during either of the two periods. Yeah. Okay. So I think I understand. And Dan, you can if I don't answer this correctly, um, help me help me understand your question. But um, I think you're asking. You're only running a a route one time you know, in one or the other lunar cycle. I think that's what you're asking. And the answer to that is yes, you you have these two opportunities to conduct a survey. You don't have to conduct the same the survey of the, on the same route in both the cycles. So it's just one one run of the survey. It's just those are your two chances to run them. So so we could do a different route than if we get if we complete one, like yes. Then you can just do as many as you like, I guess. Yeah. Yes, I love. I love the. I love how that sounds. <laughs> Kate is nodding because Kate's one of our our more prolific uh, root covers. Uh, Nate. Kate runs uh, several routes a year. Um, in fact, I, I think you. Yeah, you picked up another this year. So. Um, yeah. So you can run. You can run many routes. Um, 
I always end up running several several routes each year. And it was a lot more challenging. We used to be running routes at sunset, running routes at the moonrise, and then rerunning routes during another winter cycle before. So this is going to enable people that want to run a lot of surveys. You know, you can run several in a, in a season, unless it decides to downpour every single night of our survey window. So it, again, I, I, I guess I, you know, I definitely would support people that want to run a lot of routes, but tempered by the idea that I know it seems like there are a lot of days in there, but the weather always messes things up. So, um, you know, if you want to pick up multiple routes, you know, picking, doing three, three or four routes, very, very possible. Also, you can run more than one route a night. So my routes are kind of near each other. So when I end one, then I can go to the start of the next one and, and run it. Yes. And we'll get some good stuff down. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's a it's a really great idea because oftentimes if when when you have a night like that where the conditions are great, I mean it's wonderful to go out and run several routes. Just check off, check them off your list when the conditions are good, because the next time you go out, it might not be as ideal. And there are some nights that are just perfect. I mean, they're just wonderful nights to be out. It's relatively warm. There's no wind. The moon is bright. You can you can see well. You can hear everything well. Yeah, can't beat it. Okay. Well, unless anyone else has any questions, we can we can wrap up. Um, again, I will uh, make this recording uh, available. It should be available tomorrow. Um, and again, if you haven't received your maps yet, you're going to have them tomorrow. And please uh, please do reach out if you have any questions. If you want to adopt more routes, you know, Aunt, uh, Amy. I mean, if you want to pick up another route, by all means, um, let me know. And uh, and yeah, no, I'm excited for you for you guys to get out there. Uh, whether you're a returning volunteer or a new volunteer, I'm every year. I'm so excited to to hear what you guys find. Um, it's been very very interesting, and it's extremely valuable information for us. Um, so thank you for for all that you're doing. Appreciate it. Okay, all right. I hope everyone has a great night. Take care. Thanks for joining. Thank Bye now.